to Welcome to the MCTV Bi-Weekly Marist News Update. I'm Jen Keen. And I'm Bonnie Orr. We've got a lot in store for you this week, so let's jump right into our first story. New York City public schools owned by Catholic churches banned sex education and lessons on HIV and AIDS as a result of a quietly kept and long-term agreement between church and city officials. Many city schools that lease church-owned buildings must take students off-site for sex education. The argument irritated some parents and students who believe that students should be taught sex ed and lessons about HIV and AIDS, which are mandated by law in their classrooms. To receive annual sex ed lessons, 15-year-old Tayshawn Edmonds from Brooklyn must walk 15 minutes across the neighborhood to El Puente's offices. Tayshawn said, quote, the church owns the building, so they call the shots, but I don't see why they can't get to control what we're doing at our school. The church's no sex ed policy has been in place since the city started renting space for schools in 2005. For sex education, students at the schools must go off-site to facilities owned by the city or to local nonprofits. State law enacted in 1987 requires city schools to administer lessons on HIV and AIDS to every student in each grade at least once per year. Church officials believe that it is in their right to banish the city's sex ed and HIV AIDS instruction from their buildings and have no plans to change. The policy is unpopular with parents who argue that the church is overstepping its bounds by forcing tenant schools to take students off the premises for these lessons. What do you think about that? I think that's tough for the kids to have to walk that far. Agreed. I, I think that they should get their education on sex anywhere in, in the schools that they go to school at, you know. My favorite part of sixth grade was sex education, and I don't know what I, where I would be without that. <laughs> well, there you go. Speaking of controlling schools, bust out the books, kids. It turns out your professors may be turning into Big Brother. At Texas A&M, teachers are taking full advantage of a new technology that will actually tell them if students are doing the reading or not using online textbooks. A company called CourseSmart is jumping on the bandwagon as it develops a way to track digital learning. CourseSmart complies all the professor's material online for the students to access. It also has developed a guide for teachers to look at and track the students' participation in the online resources. It is called Engagement Index. However, Professor Adrian Guardia does not know how well this system is actually working. He monitors 70 students from three classes on his CourseSmart guide and finds that even though some of his students are getting good grades, their engagement indexes are showing low grades. Guardia says that, quote, it was one of those aha moments. Are you really learning if you only open the book the night before the test? On the other hand, students are feeling a bit of pressure from this new learning instrument as well. Senior Hillary Torres says that, quote, if he looks and sees Hillary is not really reading as much as I thought, does that give him a negative image of me? It seems like a step in the right direction for education, but there are also some fallbacks to the system that need to be worked out before it can be fully integrated in schools. That's kind of scary. I think if my professors could see all the time when I was reading when I was not, I mean, you know. Yeah, they wouldn't like me very much. <laughs> and I don't think they would like any Marist students very much anymore. <laughs> we, we got a lot going on. <laughs> While that program may struggle to get integrated, there is one school that is solving this problem as we speak. As spring approaches, the time for homecomings, proms, and formals comes along with it. In Southern Georgian High School, the prom this year will be hopefully be one for the books. Never before has this school seen an integrated prom or homecoming dance. That's right, the days of desegregation didn't seem to reach this small town's borders. Now, catching up with the times, Wilcox County High School will be making efforts to organize a prom that is inclusive to all of the student body. Before this year, students who were black went to one dance and students who were white went to another. It is very important also to understand that these dances were not planned by the school board members, but parents and students on committees. Although this may seem like a welcome change, there is some backlash from students attending the high school who are against the idea of racially diverse proms. Posters for the event have been torn off the walls and there have even been students boycotting the formal. However, school officials are raving about the idea of this new trend. Superintendent Sm Steve Smith wrote that he, quote, not only applauded their idea, but we also passed a resolution advocating that all activities involving our students be inclusive and non-discriminatory. 
So far, the school has sold 50 tickets to the prom. They're hoping to reach at least 100 before the dance happens. I can't even believe that this is an issue in 2013. I, that's crazy. These students are living in a bubble. I've never heard of that happening anywhere else. Agreed. It's too bad. Speaking of change, around this time of year, there is a switch in power between the retiring student body president and the rising one. On April 5th, Deborah Aquinwami and Jane Tracy took over the much sought after president and executive vice president of the Marist student body. Here with an exclusive interview is Allie Reed. Here with Deb Akinwunami, student body president for Marist 2013 to 2014. How are you, Deb? I'm good. I'm excited to be here. I thought you are. So let me know what is the most exciting part about being elected student body president. Oh gosh. Well, I don't think I've had a question like that. Um, I honestly think it's just going to be exciting to see so many different facets of campus and just have an insight on how all these things um, all these things work and all these things run like already I already um, had a meeting with the Alumni Association and especially as a soon-to-be senior it's so interesting to see how active the alumni is still in Marist College and I think that's so exciting and I can't wait to just share as much as I possibly can with the rest of the student body. So are you waiting until next year? Because I know you were sworn in officially this semester already. Right. Are you waiting until next year to make your first act as president or are you going to be doing anything that we're going to see this semester? Um, I think for the most part a crux of what we plan on doing is going to happen next semester. Um, right now, a lot of what we're doing is we're trying to assimilate our new student government members and help them transition into their positions because we have a, a lot of new members. Um, and we're also trying to help them just get their feet wet, help them figure out what it is that they want to do, how their mission can align with our mission and how their plans can align with ours. Um, so there might be little things here and there, but a substantial amount of what we are going to do is going to be seen next semester. So what is the mission of you and Jane and your entire administration? Like, what do you hope to accomplish by the time that you leave? A lot of things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess to put it in broad perspectives, um, it's actually funny that you mentioned that because during our um, elections process when Jane and I were going around campaigning, we would say these things. Um, so one thing that we want to do is we want to have an impact on the Marist College community that is visible, tangible, and noticeable for all Marist constituents. Then we want to do something within the Marist community that is permanent and that outlasts the current freshman class. And lastly, we want to find a way to affect and impact the global community with the Marist name. So hopefully by the end of our term, in, one may, um, in a lot of different ways, we'll have accomplished those three different things. So when you first came to Marist yeah. and you were looking over the Hudson, you were like, I want to be a student here. You weren't even accepted yet. Yeah. Did you have any idea that you would be running the school by the time you were a senior? I don't think so. I don't, I don't know if anyone would. Um, I know I definitely wanted to be a part of student government because I did it in high school. But I know. There, I would have never imagined that I would be here today. I believe it. I believe it. Well, thank you so much. I really look forward to all of your plans over the next few years. Definitely. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Back to you guys. Looking at the rise and fall of others, here's Brittany Jelinski with Who's Hot in Hollywood. Thanks, Bonnie. Well, we have a lot, in, we have a lot to talk about today, so let's jump right in. Chelsea Handler is causing some controversy due to her appearance on The Letterman Show when she joked saying that Letterman was a, quote, small man. It turns out that the two were talking about their careers on late night TV and Letterman said that he would be lucky for any job, not expecting that Handler would insult him. Handler tried to recover saying, quote, you're not particularly large, you're very dainty for a man, and I mean that in the nicest way possible. Personally, I think Chelsea Handler is hilarious and people shouldn't take her insults so literally. However, along with Letterman, she has offended stars like Conan O'Brien, Kim Kardashian, and Angelina Jolie. In more shocking news, the reality star from the MTV show Buck Wild, Shane Gandy, was found dead earlier last week. 
The 21-year-old was reported missing, and police found Gandhi, his uncle, and a friend of the family Monday morning in Sissonville, West Virginia. Along with the death of the show's most beloved character, one of the other young stars, Sawa Amin, is in jail for having failed a drug test that broke her probation from a previous arrest in February. In more unfortunate news, film critic Robert Ebert lost his battle with cancer last week. The acclaimed critic had been suffering from various cancers of the thyroid and salivary glands for the past decade. Ebert's family and friends said that he had a very peaceful death, and we can all definitely say that Roger Ebert will hold a special place in cinema for a long time. Time to talk about Roger Ebert's favorite topics, movies that are out in theaters. The horror film Evil Dead has swept the box office completely over any other competition. Evil Dead is being considered a rare horror remake because it remained true to the original Evil Dead made in 1981 while taking on a new interpretation. If you're thinking that this is just some B-rated horror movie with bad actors, a poor plot, think again. Evil Dead is shocking audiences everywhere with its cinematography, intense sequences, and character drama. And the movie I'm most excited to see is 42. The movie tells the true story of Jackie Robinson when he made history by playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers and breaking the color barrier in baseball. The film star Chadwick Boseman had to prepare for the role watching Jackie Robinson tapes and working with different baseball coaches to completely emulate Robinson's style. Boseman commented on how happy and honored he is to take on such a role, and he is excited for audiences everywhere to learn about the moving and challenging strides that Robinson took to become an American legend. While that's all we have time for for this week, I'm Brittany Jelinski, keeping you in the know. With more from the art and film world, on Friday, April 5th, Marist College Club of Theater Arts, or MICTA, debuted Treasure Island, this semester's play for children's theater. At the start of the play, audiences are clued into a secret word that whenever they hear a character say it, they whoop, holler, and cheer towards the stage. The play became interactive as the characters of Treasure Island got surprised when they were interrupted each time. The adventure begins when a dreadful pirate captain, Billy Bones, who has a bit of a drinking problem, gives his treasure map to Jim Hawkins and his family before he dies. Jim and his family, with the help of a few other characters, follow the map across the sea while running from pirates. The trouble that finds them makes the play all the more fun. The over-the-top characters, pirate jokes, clever set design, and use of projection make Treasure Island a high-valued production and a must-see for both old and new theater lovers. MICTA's production has two full casts to help manage the number of showings that Children's Theater puts on each year. Some of the leads were Dan Smith as Jim, Rob Peter Paul as Captain Bones, Michelle Scar as Auntie Nan, Marissa Russo as Dr. Livesley, Alyssa Bianca as Belle Gunn, and many, many more. This year's Children's Theater production follows last year's hit production of Thumbelina. This week, the Marist campus will see buses full of elementary schoolers as they flood the campus for their chance to see Treasure Island. Don't miss your chance to learn Treasure Island's secret word and take part in Marist College Club of Theater Arts' last play in the Nellie Gletty of the Year. What a fun idea. I love that. I didn't get to see it. I was off campus this weekend, but that sounded really fun. That sounds great. I just hope no students take it, things out of their lunch and throw them on stage. <laughs> I would get carried away. <laughs> well, awesome. moving to our sports report, here's Chris Caligari. Thanks, Bonnie. Here's what's going on in sports this week. This past weekend featured the men's Final Four in Atlanta, Georgia, with Louisville squaring off against underdog Wichita State and Syracuse battling Michigan with Player of the Year Trey, Bur Trey Burke. This was Michigan's first trip to the Final Four in 20 years, since the days of the ever-so-popular Fab Five. As many of you probably heard, Louisville's guard Kevin Ware sustained a, a gruesome injury during the team's game against Duke in the Elite Eight. The team says they can overcome this injury and want to win it all for their embattered teammate. Louisville defeated Wichita State 72-68, and Michigan defeated Syracuse 61-56. Both schools have not won a national championship in over 20 years. But on Monday, Louisville succeeded in its pursuit of their first na national championship since 1989. By winning, Louisville head coach Rick Pitino became the first coach in NCAA basketball history to win two national championships with two completely different schools. In other news, the college basketball world was shocked was taken by storm the past week after Rutgers head men's basketball coach Mike Rice was exposed on ESPN's Outside the Lines for verbally and physically abusing the, his players. With a series, a series of tapes were released to ESPN that contained clips of practices over a three-year, over a course of three years, where, co where Coach Rice hurled basketballs at his players' heads, used homophobic slurs, slurs, and displayed dangerous levels of abuse. Rice and his assistant coach. Jimmy Martelli are no longer employed by the school. 
Rice was fired the day after Rucker, the day after the tapes aired on ESPN, and Martelli resigned. In the wake of Rice's firing, athletic director Tim Pernetti decided to resign due to his lack of action over a year ago after he uh, found out about the tapes. Faculty and New Jersey congressmen were calling for him to be fired as well. This fallout came after Pernetti was able to get Rutgers an invite into the Big Ten Conference, something many thought would be impossible for Rutgers to achieve. The boys of summer have finally hit the field as baseball season is finally upon us. The Yankees have gotten off to a slow start after losing two of three games to the Red Sox and Tigers. It seems like this will be a quite a long season for the Bronx Bombers. The Mets began the season going 2-2 two and two with much promise from the young pitching staff and lineup. Well, that's all I have for sports this week. Helping you stay on top of who's on top in sports, I'm Chris Caligari. Back to you guys. Scientists have been trying to figure out exactly why people dream for years, but their latest research is to find out the function of dreaming. New studies show that measuring people's brain activity during waking moments, researchers began to pick out the signatures of specific dream Im imagery, such as a key or a bed. Masako Tamaki, a neuroscience scientist at Brown University, commented, saying, quote, Using this method, we might be able to know more about the function of dreaming. Functional magnetic renaissance imaging, or fMRI, was the tactic that scientists used on three people as they were sleeping, and over 200 images were collected, after they connected the image to the brain activity. Scientists hope to further their studies in order to learn what goes on in the brain when people have nightmares. And for our last story of the night, we're reliving the past. New information is emerging this week about the person responsible for a deadly shooting in December. Just two weeks before the day Adam Lanza walked into Sandy Hook Elementary School and killed 20 children and six adults, his mother, Nancy Lanza, found gruesome drawings in his room but failed to discuss the images with him. A family's friend described the violent image, saying, quote, One drawing had a woman clutching a religious item, like rosary beads, and holding a child, and she was getting all shot up in the back with blood flying everywhere. Investigators found emails that were sent by Nancy Lanza indicating that although she was deeply troubled by what she saw, she needed time before she could bring up the matter with her son. This is just another piece of the puzzle that indicated a long history of problems in the Lanza household. One of the parents of a victim commented on 60 Minutes this past Sunday saying, quote, it was like a set of dominoes, in many ways just waiting for one to tick the next one over. Other people affected by the tragedy also believe that gaps in parenting, along with unresolved medical issues, may have contributed to Adam Lanza's actions. How sad that if just one person said something, maybe the whole thing could have been prevented. I know, you can't predict the future, but we can definitely learn from this. Absolutely. Looks like that's all we have for you tonight. I'm Jen Keen. And I'm Bonnie Orr. You stay foxy, Marist College.